The Flip Side by Adam J. Jackson Narrated by Gordon Griffin Prologue All the world is full of suffering. It is also full of overcoming. Helen Keller The boy was just twelve years old. He sat looking at the ground, picking nervously at his fingers, waiting for the doctor to answer. The doctor was a tall, lanky man in his early sixties. There was nothing warm about him. He had slicked back grey hair, a sharp pointed nose, and pursed thin lips. He wore small round spectacles that made his pale grey eyes look like small marbles. He picked up his papers, squared the edges, and put them down again before removing his spectacles and looking straight at the boy. I'm sorry, son, said the doctor, but what you have is not going to go away. If I give you what you're asking for, I'd be doing you a disservice. The sooner you learn to live with this, the better. But if you could just... began the boy. Listen to me, interrupted the doctor. It's for the best. The boy's eyes began to well. He could feel his chest tighten. Without raising his head, he stood up and left the room. The condition the boy was suffering from was a skin complaint known as psoriasis. It is characterized by red, flaky lesions of the skin. In many cases, it is confined to a patient's elbows and knees, and some people suffer with it on their scalp. But the boy had thick, scaly lesions all over his body. He had first noticed it one morning when clusters of red spots appeared on the sides of his abdomen. That was only two months earlier. But over the ensuing weeks, the spots had become bigger and spread over his entire body. The boy had gone to the school doctor, asking not for a cure. He'd already been told by his family doctor that there was no cure. What the boy had asked the school doctor for, pleaded for, was an off-game slip so that he wouldn't have to attend the swimming class. As he walked along the corridor and out of the building, the boy could hold back his tears no longer. Oblivious to everything and everyone, his only thoughts were of how all the other children would react when he turned up at swimming class looking like a leper. Then the inevitable questions would turn over in his head until he felt nauseous. Why me? Why did this have to happen to me? Why is life so unfair? Suddenly he felt a hand on his shoulder. He turned to find his form tutor, Mr. Greenstein, standing beside him. Mr. Greenstein was a small figure of a man, hardly a few inches taller than the boy. He wore a plain grey suit with a white shirt and navy blue tie. He was a gentleman, softly spoken, who was well liked by the children in his class. What's wrong? Mr. Greenstein asked. Nothing sighed the boy as he wiped his eyes. Come and take a seat. Just for a minute, insisted Mr. Greenstein. Mr. Greenstein and the boy sat down on a bench under a large oak tree away from the school buildings. Now, tell me what's upsetting you. Perhaps I can help. No one can help, murmured the boy. Well, let's at least try, said Mr. Greenstein. The boy rolled up his sleeve to reveal large, red, scaly patches of skin and explained his situation. When he had finished explaining, Mr. Greenstein put his hand on the boy's shoulder. Who takes your swimming class? Mr. Cunningham. You know, if you like, you and I could go and speak to Mr. Cunningham, and I'm sure we could persuade him to excuse you from the class. Really? Absolutely. But before we do, let me tell you something. When I was seven years old, my father died, and I developed a stutter. Like your skin problem, it happened very quickly, almost overnight. It became so bad that, like you, I didn't want to go to school. I was frightened that the other children would make fun of me. I argued and argued about it with my mother. But in the end, I knew that I had to go to school. And I'm glad I did, because... If I hadn't, I wouldn't have had an education. I wouldn't have become a teacher. And I wouldn't be here sitting with you now. Mr. Greenstein looked the boy squarely in the eye. Every difficulty that we face in life 
has a flip side. What's a flip side? mumbled the boy. Every problem or obstacle contains an opportunity as big and sometimes bigger than the problem itself. The flip side is that opportunity. The boy pulled up his sleeve. What possible flip side could there be in this? What opportunity could there possibly be in having to look like a leper in front of all the other kids? Well, let's think about it for a minute, answered Mr. Greenstein. Let's see if we can find the flip side. Introduction Each problem has hidden within it an opportunity so powerful that it literally dwarfs the problem. The greatest success stories were created by people who recognized a problem and turned it into an opportunity. Joseph Sugarman The first time I met someone who had found the flip side was on a cold winter evening in February 1981. In fact, that night I met not one, but two remarkable people, both of whom spoke about the key events that had changed their lives. While I don't remember their names, the events of that evening have stayed with me. It was an evening I would never forget. I just watched the Student Drama Society at Southampton University perform an outstanding production of a play called Whose Life Is It Anyway? The play tells the story of a man who wakes up in hospital following a serious car accident to discover that he is quadriplegic. He has no feeling and no control over any part of his body below his neck. The story is utterly compelling. The man's life prior to the accident revolved around his work as an artist. Discovering that he is paralysed and unwilling to face the prospect of a life in which he has no control of anything, the man pleads with the hospital authorities to help him die. When they refuse, he initiates a legal battle for the right to end his life. It is a brilliantly scripted drama that explores the emotional journey of a man whose bright, witty and vibrant mind has become trapped in a useless body. It also highlights the legal and moral issues surrounding euthanasia. In the ensuing legal battle, it becomes apparent that the man starts to feel differently about his life. He starts to build relationships with the people around him, and the challenge of the court case gives meaning to his daily life. I won't tell you how the play ends. Suffice to say that, if you get an opportunity to see it, or the film version starring Richard Dreyfus, I'm sure that you'll find it a very thought-provoking and memorable evening. As an undergraduate reading law, I'd been especially interested to see the play because at that time we were covering the legal and ethical issues around the subject of euthanasia in our degree course. One of the core issues that arose from the play was whether a person could be considered mentally stable or emotionally capable of making a rational decision immediately after they have suffered such a drastic physical and emotional trauma. If not, what period of time would need to pass, or what test would they need to take, before they could be considered capable of making a rational decision? The evening I saw the play back in 1981 was particularly memorable because the play was followed by an open discussion about the issues raised in the storyline. The play's director was joined on stage by a law professor, a psychology professor and two other men, both of whom were sitting in wheelchairs. The law professor spoke about the issues that need to be addressed when considering the legalisation of euthanasia. Suicide is not a criminal offence in the UK, and therefore one could argue that helping someone who wants to die, but who is physically incapable of committing suicide, should also not be a criminal offence. If a loved one was suffering and asked you to help end their suffering by handing them a bottle of tablets, would you hand it to them? Should you, by doing so, be guilty of murder or manslaughter? If an able-bodied person is permitted to take a bottle of tablets to end his or her life, should a person who is paralysed be denied the same right, just because he or she can't physically pick up the bottle? How far should the law go in criminalising the act of helping someone who wants to end their own life? It seems straightforward enough. Most people wouldn't hesitate to end the suffering of an animal 
So why would we not extend the same compassion to humans? The more one reflects upon the issues, the more one discovers that it is anything but straightforward. One of the key questions that we kept coming back to was how long after such a major trauma could a person who wants to commit suicide be said to be of sound mind and capable of making a rational decision? The psychologist took up the discussion and explained that any trauma will affect a person's cognitive and behavioural patterns. It is known as post-traumatic stress disorder and usually develops within the first three months following a traumatic event. However, it can take up to a year before symptoms become apparent and these can include depression, suicidal tendencies, nightmares, anger rages and flashbacks. For an individual who has suffered one of the worst physical and emotional traumas of losing control over virtually their entire body, with all the consequences that flow from that, there is no way of knowing how capable or not they are of making a rational decision. All that is certain, the psychologist argued, is that they are incapable of making a decision of such finality within the first three months following the trauma. At this point, the two men in the wheelchair spoke to the audience. Their comments had a deep and lasting impression on me, so much so that I can remember it over 25 years later. The two men explained that in the immediate weeks following their accidents, they had indeed wanted to die. But in the months that followed, their lives and their attitudes began to change. They were faced with new challenges every day, Challenges that were hardly challenges at all prior to their accidents. Challenges like getting washed and dressed in the morning, but challenges nonetheless. Their accidents had forced them to re-evaluate their lives, their hopes, their dreams and their aspirations. It was this, they both said, that brought about something they had not expected. The two men, in their own ways, had found the will to live. The thing that I found most astonishing was that both men went on to say that their lives had become far richer and more fulfilled following their accidents than they had ever been before their accidents. They claimed that they were much happier now than they had been, and they both went so far as to say that their accidents had been the best things to have happened to them. I found their comments shocking. How could anyone claim that an incident which left them paralysed and confined to a wheelchair for the rest of their life was the best thing to have happened to them? A $105 social security check and a chicken recipe. Harlan Sanders was 65 years old when, through no fault of his own, he lost the business that he had spent the best part of his adult life building. At a time when many men his age were either retired or looking forward to retiring, Harland was facing financial ruin. He found himself having to live on nothing but a $105 social security check. But this experience proved to be one of the best things to have happened to Harland, because the loss of his business would become the catalyst for something incredible. Harland would go on to find the flip side. That Harland was able to find the flip side was no accident. He was no stranger to difficult times. Born on the 9th of September, 1890, in Indiana, USA, Harland's childhood was anything but easy. Before Harland had reached his sixth birthday, his father died, and Harland's mother had no choice but to go out to work. Instead of attending school, Harland was given the responsibility of taking care of his three-year-old brother and baby sister. This meant that Harland had to cook and clean for his siblings. By all accounts, he excelled in both. According to his mother, by the time he was seven years old, Harland was a master at preparing numerous regional dishes. At age ten, Harland got his first paid job, working on a nearby farm, for two dollars a month. When he was twelve, his mother remarried, and he left his home near Henryville, Indiana, for a job on a farm in Greenwood. He held a series of jobs over the next few years, first as a 15-year-old streetcar conductor in New Albany, 
and then as a 16-year-old private soldiering for six months in Cuba. During the years that followed, Harlan worked as a railroad fireman, studied law by correspondence, practiced in justice of the peace courts, sold insurance, operated an Ohio River steamboat ferry, sold tires, and finally ended up operating a service station in Corbin, Kentucky. When he was 40, Harland tried a new initiative by offering meals to hungry travelers who stopped at his service station. He didn't have a restaurant at that time, but served his customers simple, local recipes on his own dining table in the living quarters of his service station. It wasn't long before Harland realized that there was a real opportunity to expand his garage business, and he took the decision to open a restaurant in premises across the street that seated 142 people. In a short time, Harlan's reputation for serving delicious home-cooked food grew. His restaurant was listed in Good Food Guides for the area, and Harland even received honors from the state governor, Ruby Lafoon, in 1935, in recognition of his contribution to the state's cuisine. But life changes, and in the mid-1950s, a new interstate highway was planned to bypass the town of Corbin, diverting the traffic, and with it, the bulk of Harland's customers. Harland was 65 years of age. A few months earlier, he had a successful business, and could have expected to be able to retire quite comfortably whenever he chose. Yet now he was facing financial ruin. His garage and restaurant were auctioned off, and this was how, after paying the last of his debtors, Harland was reduced to living on his $105 social security checks. However, within a few years, Harland would look back on the catastrophe that befell him when the new state highway caused him to lose his business and see it not as a disaster, but as the opportunity through which he found celebrity and success the likes of which he could never have dreamed of and would, in all probability, never have attained had his garage and restaurant survived. Having lost his business and livelihood through no fault of his own, it would have been easy for Harland to have given up. Who could have blamed him, particularly at his time of life, if he had become bitter and resentful? Fortunately for Harland, in those days the practice of attributing blame and seeking compensation from the state didn't come as easily as they do today. Instead of complaining or finding someone to blame, Harland set out to look for the flip side and found it in the unlikeliest of places, a chicken recipe. Harland knew that his chicken recipe was special and had been loved by his customers, so Armed with only his secret recipe, a coveted blend of eleven herbs and spices, he travelled across the country, visiting one restaurant after another in the hope that some restaurateurs would be so impressed that they'd be willing to pay to use his recipe. Harland cooked batches of chicken for the restaurant owners and their employees. If their reaction was favourable, he entered into a handshake agreement on a deal that stipulated a payment to him of a nickel for each chicken that the restaurant sold. The rest, as they say, is history. By 1964, Harland, who was known as the Colonel, had opened 600 franchised outlets for his chicken in the United States and Canada. That year, he sold his interest in the U.S. company for $2 million to a group of investors but the colonel remained the public face and spokesman for the company. In 1976, an independent survey ranked the colonel as the world's second most recognisable celebrity. Today, Colonel Sanders' KFC, originally Kentucky Fried Chicken outlets, are found in more than 82 countries around the world and serve up over 2 billion dinners every year. Until he was fatally stricken with leukemia in 1980 at the age of 90, the colonel travelled over 250,000 miles a year, visiting the KFC empire he founded. And it all began with a 65-year-old gentleman 
who had lost everything, but refused to be beaten by circumstances, with nothing more than a hundred and five dollar social security check and a chicken recipe, he had found the flip side. Smiling from Cracked Teeth When Simon Perchall had a biking accident that left him with a mouthful of cracked teeth, it could have ruined him financially. He'd been cycling home from work, and as he turned a corner he skidded and was thrown off his bicycle. He landed face down and smashed his jaw on the curb of the pavement. Initially, he thought that only a few teeth had chipped, but four teeth then became infected. After a thorough examination, Simon's dentist discovered that four of Simon's teeth had been badly cracked and would need to be replaced. The total cost to repair the chipped teeth and replace the cracked teeth with implants would be in excess of £20,000. Initially, it seemed that Simon had little option but to borrow the money and have the work done. However, Simon's wife Veronica, who was a qualified dental nurse from Hungary, suggested that they look at having the work done in Budapest. Like most people, I had a few reservations about going to an ex-communist country for dental work, but it was amazing, Simon said. The level of service and expertise was fantastic. I decided to have all the treatment done there and saved about £16,000. When he returned to the UK, Simon found the flip side to his accident. It dawned on him and Veronica that there could be a business opportunity helping other people save money, promoting and marketing the specialist dental treatments offered in Hungary. The fact that Veronica was Hungarian and a qualified dental nurse made the decision to start the business that much easier, and within a matter of months their company, Smile Savers, was launched. Today, Smile Savers is a hugely successful business, which has enabled Simon to free himself from his previous work as an IT consultant. Both he and Veronica work in their own business, building a future together. Whether it was down to fate or just the randomness of life that Simon suffered his biking accident is immaterial to him and to our search for the flip side. The injury itself would have been sufficient to send many lesser people into a state of depression. And that is without the financial implications of having to find £20,000 to repair the damaged teeth. But what is significant about this story is that Simon Perchall's accident proved to be a huge opportunity. It was the catalyst that would change his life. Simon managed to grasp that opportunity and turn the incident round to his advantage. He now looks back on the whole affair of his accident with a smile. A smile with a set of straight teeth, knowing that without that accident, he wouldn't be enjoying the lifestyle he enjoys today. Simon Perchall had found the flip side. The search for the flip side. Was it just a matter of luck that the two disabled men who were confined to their wheelchairs were able to find something in their disabilities that brought their lives greater meaning and happiness? Was it the hand of fate that led to Harlan Sanders being able to create a worldwide success that would never have been achieved had he not lost everything first? And was it simply just good fortune that Simon Perchall was able to build a successful dental business following his bike accident? Or could there be something else involved? Could there be a common thread that runs through these stories and many others like them? Something which has enabled ordinary people to literally flip a seemingly adverse event or circumstance and find opportunities that would otherwise have remained hidden. The flip side is an attempt to answer these questions with the help of a simple, yet controversial and life-changing philosophy. At its core is a belief that every problem or obstacle, however big or small that life places in our path, contains an equivalent or greater benefit or opportunity. That benefit or opportunity is known as the flip side. To find the secrets of the flip side, I'm going to take you to South Africa to meet the man with no feet who holds world records in 100 metres, 200 metres and 400 metres track running events 
and has become a worldwide sporting phenomenon. We will visit Spain to learn from one of the most promising footballers of his generation who lost his career and his boyhood dreams in a tragic car accident, but went on to achieve other dreams, bigger dreams, that led to worldwide fame and fortune. I will introduce you to a blind magician who will explain why the disease that took away 90% of his eyesight when he was just nine years old was a gift. We will hear from a man who lost his job, but in doing so went on to change the face of entertainment in America. And we will meet a man who survived Auschwitz and transformed the world of psychology. We will go back in time to witness past tragedies and personal disasters that were turned into life-affirming events. I will introduce you to many remarkable people, and together we will learn from them and from the problems and obstacles that they faced. At times it will not be easy. We will bear witness to considerable suffering and trauma. We will discover tragedies beyond our own experiences. But by the end of the journey, we may understand something that for many is and has been the single most important secret to achieving lasting success and happiness in life. Welcome to the flip side. Adam J. Jackson, Javier, Spain, November 2008 Part 1 Discoveries Finding the flip side. A year ago, my life had collapsed around me. I worked myself into exhaustion. My father died, and my relationships were in turmoil. Little did I know at the time, out of my greatest despair was to come the greatest gift. Rhonda Byrne, The Secret Chapter 1. The Road to Madrid One Man's Journey to the Flipside When one door closes, another opens. But we often look so regretfully upon the closed door that we don't see the one that has opened for us. Helen Keller On the evening of the 22nd of September, 1963, Four young men set off in a car to travel from Mahadahonda to Madrid in Spain. The four were all good friends, enjoying the night out, but it was to be a journey they would never forget. Julio was one of the four men in the car that night. His dream was to become a professional football player and play for the team he had loved as a boy, Real Madrid. He had nurtured his dream and pursued it from his earliest years and that dream was just beginning to be realized. He had immense talent and emerged as something of a prodigy. Real Madrid had signed Julio as a goalkeeper, and he was widely tipped to be the future number one goalkeeper for the Spanish national team. Life couldn't have been better for Julio. His star was on the rise until the evening he stepped into the car with his friends. As fate would have it, his dream would end that night. At around 2 a.m., the car Julio and his friends were traveling in was involved in a serious accident. Julio awoke in Madrid's Eloy Gonzalo Hospital to discover that he was semi-paralyzed. The doctors informed him that he would need to be confined to a bed for 18 months in order to give his spinal injuries a chance to heal. Even then, the prognosis wasn't good. They thought it would be unlikely that Julio would ever walk again. But there was one thing that was not in doubt. His football career was over. At night, during those 18 months in hospital, Julio would listen to the radio and write poems, sad, reflective, romantic verses that questioned man's fate and the meaning of life. On reading the poems that Julio had written, one of the young male nurses who was taking care of him, a man called Aladio Magdaleno, gave Julio a guitar and suggested he turn his poems into songs, 
Singing began as a distraction for Julio, a way of forgetting happier days spent as an athlete. But as time went on, the singing became more of a passion than a distraction. He scribbled numbers on the guitar to learn the basic chords. Every week, more and more would appear, and within a short time, he was creating melodies for his poems. When the eighteen months had passed, and Julio had recovered from his injuries, he decided to return to Mercia University to resume his studies. Later, he travelled to England to improve his English, first in Ramsgate, Kent, and then at Bell's Language School in Cambridge. Occasionally at weekends, he would sing in the airport pub, covering songs that were popular at that time, from the likes of Tom Jones, Engelbert Humperdinck, and the Beatles. When Julio returned home to Spain, he looked for a singer to perform his songs. He took his first song to a recording studio in Madrid and asked if they could recommend a singer. The manager, looking at Julio and listening to him perform the song, was confused. Why would a man like Julio need someone to sing his songs? Julio was a strikingly handsome man with jet black hair, large brown eyes, a smooth tanned complexion, and a smile that could make most women go weak at the knees. He also had a distinctive singing voice that was pitch perfect. Why don't you perform it yourself? The manager asked. Julio answered, Because I'm not a singer. But in the end, Julio took the manager's advice and entered one of his songs in a Spanish music contest. On the 17th of July, 1968, a little over five years after the accident that so nearly destroyed his life, he won first prize at the Fiesta de Benidorm with the song La Vida Sigue Igual, Life Goes On the Same. And soon after, he was offered a contract with Columbia Records. Chances are you will have heard Julio singing. You may even own one of his albums. For the man who had lost his boyhood dreams in that tragic car accident went on to become the biggest-selling recording artist in the history of Latin American music and a household name the world over. The man who had lost his dreams found the flip side through a new, bigger dream than the one that was taken from him. His name is Julio Iglesias. Negative Experiences Positive Outcomes Every problem has a gift for you in its hands. Richard Bach The flip side is the other side of a problem or obstacle, the side that contains an opportunity that can change our lives for the better. While it may sound like something that is rarely seen other than in a Hollywood movie or a novel, there is now a growing body of scientific evidence demonstrating that the flip side is a very real phenomenon, the secrets of which can literally transform people's lives. Julio Iglesias' story, while remarkable, is certainly not unique. People of different backgrounds and races, and from all walks of life, have suffered setbacks and faced seemingly insurmountable problems and obstacles and gone on to transform them into something positive. Often those problems and obstacles are, at the same time, events that trigger change and move us in new directions. In addition, it is not uncommon for people to look back and, with the benefit of hindsight, come to see their experiences in a different light. Some come away feeling that they have actually benefited in one way or another. They are certain that their lives have been enriched rather than injured. Trauma and adversity of all kinds have literally been flipped into positive outcomes. And often the flip side turns out to be something so powerful and meaningful that it completely overshadows the negative experience. More significantly, in recent years, scientists working in clinics, hospitals and universities all over the world have begun to explore the nature of the flip side and unlock its secrets. Evidence presented from eminent psychologists, behaviorists and economists clearly demonstrates that more often than not, the greatest problems, obstacles and adversities we face in life are, at the same time, our greatest opportunities. 
Chapter 2 Defining Moments Why the lowest points in our lives shape our future happiness and success. My good fortune was that I finally came to a point in my life when I felt like I had hit rock bottom. Anthony Robbins Personal Power Seminar Peter Jones is one of a very small, elite group of successful, high-profile entrepreneurs who've attained celebrity status both in the UK and North America. His business empire is said to be worth over £750 million, and he has an impressive CV that includes a portfolio with interests in telecommunications, consumer products, incentives and gifts, entertainment, publishing, property and, more recently, television. Following his success in The Dragon's Den, he went on to become a judge on the hit TV series American Inventor, a programme produced by his own television production company. If anyone knows anything about what it takes to succeed in business, it is Peter Jones. Yet when he looks back on his career, he will tell you that the single most significant event that changed his life and was most responsible for his success was not any of his personal achievements. It wasn't the time that he had first been selected to appear on Dragon's Den. It wasn't when he set up his first business, a tennis academy at the age of just 17. And it wasn't the time he received the Emerging Entrepreneur of the Year Award in 2002. According to Jones, the one moment that changed his life was a time early on in his career when he lost his business. During my twenties, I ran a thriving computer business which allowed me to own a nice house, a BMW, a Porsche and plenty of money to spend, Jones explains on his website. However, through a combination of circumstances, personal mistakes and learning the hard way, when a few major customers went out of business themselves, I lost the business. Losing one's livelihood can be a devastating experience. Yet it can also be a turning point. Looking back, Jones believes that losing his business in his 20s was the crucial factor that changed his life because, he explained, it made him more determined to succeed. Hitting Rock Bottom to Reach the Top Anthony Robbins is one of the best-known and most successful personal development gurus in North America. He's an extremely charismatic, inspirational man. His seminars and workshops are sell-out events. Even though the tickets can cost hundreds of dollars, tens of thousands of people all over the world gladly part with the money to attend his events. Robbins has coached CEOs of global corporations, presidents and political leaders. The New York Times reported in December 1994 that he'd been invited by President Bill Clinton along with Marianne Williamson and Dr. Stephen R. Covey, to Camp David. Robbins has also helped some of America's top sports teams and athletes to improve their performance, including golfer Greg Norman, former world number one tennis star Andre Agassi, the Los Angeles professional ice hockey team, the LA Kings, and former world heavyweight boxing champion Mike Tyson. Today, Robbins is a best-selling author and vice chairman of five corporations. Through his books and seminars, Robbins has directly impacted the lives of more than 50 million people from over 100 countries. Yet, in his seminars, one of the first messages he shares with his audience is that the catalyst for his success was not a specific achievement. It was the time when his life seemed to spin out of control. Only when he had lost everything he says and hit rock bottom, did his life finally begin to turn around. I was totally broke, he recalls. I had wiped out my company. I'd wiped out myself emotionally, and I weighed about 37 pounds heavier than I do today, having basically crashed. I began to look for what would be the foundational key to success. There is a saying I learned from an American friend. 
People change, but only when they are sick and tired of being sick and tired. Most of us have to reach the point when we say to ourselves, enough is enough. Only then are we prepared to take the necessary steps to change our lives. This is supported by the science of neurolinguistic programming, NLP, which suggests that we are all primarily motivated by two forces, pain and pleasure. And of the two, pain is the stronger motivator. Essentially, we will do more to avoid pain than we will to obtain pleasure. This is the reason, Robin says, that he was fortunate to have hit rock bottom. Sometimes we have to feel like we've sunk as low as we can go before we make the effort to make our way to the top. Both Peter Jones and Tony Robbins experienced a personal and financial crisis early on in their careers. But both men acknowledge that their crises were largely responsible for their subsequent long-term success. Their assessment of this positive side, the flip side of the loss and the challenge of a major early crisis as the catalyst that helped propel them to success, is not uncommon. Many of the world's most successful businessmen have shared the same or similar experience and credit their long-term success in life to the challenge of a major early crisis or loss. Disaster was pivotal to success. We ran out of money. I was three weeks away from getting married. My fiancé had moved to California, jobless, to join me, and the investment market had collapsed in the wake of the telecoms meltdown. Peter Fisk was only nine months into his first business venture when he faced imminent financial ruin. Today, he looks back on the disaster as a defining moment in his career. It was, he says, absolutely pivotal to the success of our company. Peter Fisk is a PhD scientist and co-founder of Wrapped Industries, a technology company in Fremont, California. He is also the author of Put Your Science to Work and works with Dr. Jeff Davis, commenting on science policy, economics and educational initiatives that affect scientists. Fisk believes that very few things in business or even in a scientific career for that matter, are safe and predictable. Things sometimes can and do go wrong. At the same time, he understands that a setback, or even what some people would consider a complete disaster, is often the catalyst that is needed for positive change. When he looks back on the cash flow disaster that very nearly ruined him, with the benefit of hindsight, he believes that the crisis was actually the making of him and his company. We needed to run out of cash in order to learn what was really necessary to make our venture succeed, he says. It forced me into a full frontal assault on potential customers and sponsors. It was that new strategy that led his company to land a major contract with the U.S. Army later that same year. When I tell the graduate students and postdocs who attend my career development workshops that running out of money was one of the best things that happened to my company, I get some confused looks, Fisk says. But he is convinced that detours, setbacks, and disasters are inevitable parts of the life of a startup company. Our near death experience forced us to develop the discipline that has allowed us to survive ever since. Peter Fisk offers a fascinating insight, which is, in fact, shared by leading business people all over the world. Setbacks and disasters, he suggests, are inevitable. But they always come with a flip side. This is because, contained within obstacles and challenges, are opportunities to learn and to grow, and very often, the obstacle itself is viewed, with the benefit of hindsight, as having been the stepping stone that laid the foundation for long-term success. The Postal Strike Sir Richard Branson faced a serious obstacle early on in his career, when British postal workers voted to go on strike. 
Branson is one of the best known and most successful businessmen in the UK. He's built up a business empire under the Virgin brand name, which includes over 200 privately owned companies operating in an array of different industries, from entertainment and leisure to travel, from communications technology, including mobile phones, broadband internet access and radio, to publishing, and from cosmetics to clothing. Since its inception in 1970, Virgin has become one of the leading brands in the UK. Like Peter Jones, Tony Robbins and Peter Fisk, Sir Richard Branson's success can be traced back to one of the most difficult and challenging times early on in his career. In the 1970s, new legislation in the UK allowed people to sell records at discounted prices, and Branson was among the first to exploit the situation by setting up a mail-order company which he called Virgin. The business proved to be a huge success. Sales rocketed, and Branson had the enviable task of having to find more and more workers to keep up with demand. Then disaster struck. Postal workers in the UK went on strike. With no realistic alternative mail service, at that time, Virgin, along with thousands of other mail-order companies across the UK, was facing ruin. However, history revealed the postal strike to have been something of a blessing in disguise. It certainly marked a major turning point in Virgin's history because it forced Branson to rethink his business strategy and look for alternative revenue streams. As a result, in the following year, he opened a Virgin record store, the first of what was to become a worldwide chain. And two years later, he launched the Virgin record label. Friday Afternoons Losing one's job will always be a defining moment in a person's career. And it usually happens on a Friday afternoon. More people get fired on Fridays than on any other day of the week. In an online poll conducted by hrnext.com and its affiliated website blr.com, human resource professionals said that in their opinion, Friday was the best day to let a worker go. Firing an employee on a Friday afternoon, they said, gives fired workers the entire weekend to cool off and receive support from friends and family. If you're an employee and worried about your job, the best advice might be to steer clear of your boss and the HR director on Fridays. While losing your job can be devastating at the time, there will always be a flip side. Salomon Brothers was one of the largest investment banks on Wall Street before it was acquired in 1982 by the commodity traders Fibro Corporation. Shortly before the news of the merger was announced, one of the partners in Salomon Brothers was summoned by the company's board and, along with 62 of his colleagues, was given notice to terminate his employment. That day proved to be a major turning point in the young banker's career. His name was Michael Bloomberg. He used his severance pay and sale of his Salomon shares to finance a new business idea that he'd been thinking about for some time. Before the internet... Financial data on the movement of currencies and stocks and shares was not easily accessible. And Bloomberg's vision was to create a network of computer terminals through which financial institutions could instantly access the data they needed. The system was a runaway success. And today, less than 30 years on, Michael Bloomberg reportedly has a personal wealth in excess of $4 billion. His business interests extend into other areas of technology and the media. But today, he is perhaps best known as one of the most successful mayors of New York City, having won two consecutive elections. Some might argue that it was hardly a personal crisis when Bloomberg was fired, because he was still left with a significant amount of capital on which to build his future. But one only has to look at the fate of many lottery winners to realize that it takes a lot more than capital to succeed in anything. It takes vision, commitment, dedication, and a willingness to take calculated risks. When someone loses their job, the issues with which they are faced are not solely related to money. 
They can be a perceived social stigma which raises feelings of personal rejection and can affect one's self-esteem. Yet, at the same time, there are many people who, like Bloomberg, have used the experience of losing their job to re-evaluate their careers and their lives and created an opportunity to make a new and fresh start. In his book, We Got Fired and It's the Best Thing That Ever Happened to Us, Ballantine 2004, Harvey Mackay cites case after case of some of the most successful people in a variety of fields, from the car industry to the media and entertainment industries, all of whom owe their success, at least in part, to the time when they lost their job. Bernie Marcus was fired as chief executive officer of Handy Dan Home Improvement Centre chain and went on to found his own company, The Home Depot, which by the end of 2007 was America's leading retailer of home improvement and construction products and services. Mark Cuban was a salesperson for Your Business Software, one of the first PC software retailers in Dallas. He was fired less than a year later for not opening the store on time, even though, at the time, he was out making a sales call for a large software purchase. After he left, Cuban followed his passion for computing and set up his own company, Micro Solutions, which he sold several years later for $6 million. Today, Cuban is an internet billionaire and the owner of the Dallas Mavericks basketball team. The list of people who have been fired but gone on to achieve incredible success seems endless. Over a career spanning 40 years, the majority of employees will at some point be made redundant. For some, it can be financially and emotionally devastating, but for others, losing their job will turn out to be the making of them. Secret Rhonda Byrne is an Australian television writer and producer. In 2007, she was listed among Time magazine's Time 100, The People Who Shape Our World, a list of the 100 most influential people in the world for that year. Rhonda was the inspiration and driving force behind a film and book that became a phenomenon. Brilliantly conceived and marketed, The Secret explains the universal law of attraction to show how we can start to change our lives through the power of thought. Without exception, according to The Secret, every human being has the ability to transform any weakness or suffering into strength, power, perfect peace, health and abundance. The message resonated with millions of people all over the world. Over two million DVDs were sold within its first year, and at the time of writing, the book has sold more than six million copies. What is most interesting about Rhonda Byrne's success with The Secret is that it was inspired at one of the lowest points in her life. Like Tony Robbins, Rhonda Byrne had literally reached rock bottom. And it was only then that she came to a realisation that was to inspire her subsequent success. On her DVD, Rhonda confides, A year ago my life had collapsed around me. I worked myself into exhaustion. My father died and my relationships were in turmoil. Little did I know at the time, out of my greatest despair was to come the greatest gift. In an interview on the story behind The Secret, Rhonda speaks of how she now sees that events in her life were unfolding for a reason. They led me to the very point where, on this particular night, what I did was I surrendered. My mind couldn't work out how to resolve all the things in my life. I collapsed in tears. It was in her turmoil that Rhonda was given a book by her daughter, and that book gave her a glimpse of what is known as the law of attraction. The belief that we attract our experiences through our thoughts and beliefs, and this inspired her to research back through history and to then produce The Secret. What is apparent from The Secret is also evident from all of the accounts we have heard here. They all echo the same sentiment, the same truth. 
It is often the lowest points in our lives that define and shape our future happiness and success. Chapter 3 Crises and Opportunities Why a crisis is always an opportunity. When written in Chinese, the word crisis is composed of two characters. One represents danger and the other represents opportunity. John F. Kennedy, Address, the 12th of April, 1959. The three boys, all brothers, were pumped up with excitement and anticipation, heading to the local cinema. It was a fresh Saturday morning in the suburbs of Manchester in 1950s Great Britain. The local cinema was full of children, some with their parents watching the show. The three boys were not on their way to watch a film. It had all been arranged with the manager. They were going to entertain the audience during the intermission by miming to a record. They were going to be a fun novelty act. But on that morning, as the boys ran to the cinema, they met with a crisis. The record to which the boys were going to mime dropped out of its sleeve and smashed on the pavement. Without a record to mime to, the boys could have been forgiven for giving up and going home. The cinema manager would have understood but they chose a different option. As they continued on to the cinema, the brothers agreed between themselves that they would still perform. Only this time, they would sing for real. The eldest of the three, Barry, played the guitar. And together with his two younger brothers, Morris and Robin, the three boys sang live to the audience. That morning was the first time the boys had ever sung in public, and the audience loved them. They were an instant hit. The crisis that had so nearly spoilt their day proved to be the catalyst that changed all three of the boys' lives. It marked the beginning of one of the most successful male pop bands, songwriters and recording artists of all time. Those three boys were the brothers Gibb, better known as the Bee Gees. It was many years later as they walked along Keppel Road in Manchester while filming a documentary of their lives, that Robin stopped at the point where that record had dropped and shattered. Turning to the camera, he mused, Had we not smashed the record that day, we wouldn't have started singing together. That broken record, or more accurately, how they responded to it, launched careers that would span over five decades. Oranges and marmalade. Crises are like triggers that propel us into situations we wouldn't have known and force us to take decisions that we wouldn't have taken. Though we often don't see it at the time, crises always come with a flip side. There's always an opportunity waiting to be found. Without the crisis that James Keeler of Dundee found himself facing in the late 1700s, so the story goes, the world might never have enjoyed the delights of orange peel in jelly that we know today as marmalade. In Portuguese, the root of the word marmalade is marmelo, meaning quince, which was the fruit of choice used to make preserves and jellies at that time. Oranges were used only to eat as fresh fruit or to be juiced, but that was about to change. A Spanish ship with a cargo of civil oranges docked in Dundee Harbour to shelter from a storm. The ship's captain was offering his cargo of oranges at a knock-down price, and Keeler thought he had got the bargain of the century. However, he soon discovered that the oranges were soft. Most of them had begun to go rotten and turn bitter. Keeler knew that they would be impossible to sell, and he was forced to acknowledge that he was facing an unprecedented financial loss. In a state of dejection and shock, Keeler took the oranges home and confessed what had happened to his wife. It is uncertain what happened next, whether it was James or his wife Janet who had the idea that saved them by turning their crisis into an instant profit. It was an idea, 
that would create a whole new industry and change the Keeler's lives forever. All we know, if the story is to be believed, is that Janet Keeler used the oranges instead of the normal quinces to make a fruit preserve. The new orange-flavoured jelly proved extremely popular, and the Keeler family went into business producing what we refer to today as marmalade. The Keeler story of the origins of marmalade may or may not be true. Some historians claim the story was fabricated. But regardless of its authenticity, the story contains a valuable message. Crises, as the Chinese sages knew from ancient times, always come with opportunities. Coming Up Roses Sarah Benjamin is another person who has built a successful business on the back of a crisis. After graduating with a science degree, Sarah returned to her hometown of Swan Hill in Victoria, Australia, to find that there was not much call for scientists. I find it quite difficult to get a job, she says. There wasn't any way to use my science degree, and I was being told that I was overqualified for the jobs that were available. With no prospects in the area, Sarah approached her mother with an idea growing roses to supply to florists in the region. Sarah's mother, Jan Slater, liked the idea, and the two women set up the business together in 2004. However, within the first year, they were facing a crisis that threatened to ruin the business almost before it had started. They couldn't have got off to a worse start. The very first crop of roses was diseased, all the blooms wilting at the head, they were completely unsaleable. The problem was traced back to a virus in the water, but by that time it was too late to salvage the roses. It was an unmitigated disaster. But at the same time, it turned out to be the seed of the future success of their business. The crisis forced Sarah Benjamin to review her business plan, and in doing so, uncover a hidden opportunity that would completely transform her business into the huge international success that it is today. Sarah realised that if her rose business was going to survive in the long term, she was going to have to search for additional avenues of income. Surfing the internet, she stumbled across something that she believed was an incredible opportunity. She had discovered the dried rose petal industry. The advantages of selling dried rose petals over standard cut flowers were obvious. The rose petals had a much longer shelf life. They were light and cheap to transport. It was also a new and exciting niche market that had been largely untapped in Australia. Dried rose petals, Sarah had discovered, were becoming popular as decoration for wedding ceremonies, parties and functions, in the USA and the UK, it was really booming, she says, and no one was really doing it in Australia. Not everyone agreed with Sarah's idea. A few people told her that she was absolutely crazy. They said, you'll be out of business within 12 months. Who on earth would want to buy rose petals? But Sarah and her mother persisted, researched the market and the industry, and proved their doubters wrong. Today, Simply Rose Petals grows and supplies hand-picked speciality dried petals for wedding decorations, spa retreats and wedding confetti, and the company is exporting all over the world. It is a thriving business that developed from an idea born out of a crisis. Slip Discs and Chocoholics Simon and Helen Pattinson live with their two young daughters, Poppy and Daisy, in a quiet village near Chichester, on the edge of Pagham Nature Reserve. They live what many would consider to be a very comfortable life and run their own business, which is very successful by any standards. The company employs in the region of a 100 people and last year turned over more than £5 million. Yet the lifestyle they enjoy today their home and family life and their business were all triggered by two crises. Eight years ago, 
Simon and Helen were both disillusioned with life working as lawyers in the city of London. They didn't know what they wanted to do, but they knew they didn't want the life of a city lawyer. We were in a sort of a catch-22 situation, Simon explains. We didn't know what we wanted to do with our lives, but we knew that we wouldn't ever get the eureka moment without freeing ourselves from what we were doing. In the end, they decided the only thing to do was to hand in their notice, sell their home in Putney, London, and go travelling. So, with nothing more than what they could carry in their backpacks, they set off to travel the world in search of inspiration and new direction in life. Even though they were turning their backs on lucrative careers to which they devoted years of training, their friends and family were incredibly supportive. Helen's father had pictured her as a future law lord, joked Simon, but if people thought we were mad, they didn't let it show. The two had become exhausted from the long days and late nights and the constant strain of commuting. We felt worn out and wanted a change, continued Simon. The main aim of travelling was to find a business idea or something that might inspire us. They didn't know what the future held for them, but they hoped that by backpacking around the world they might find some answers. Their first stop was South America. Patagonia in Argentina is famed for its mountain range and ski resorts, and it was in a small mountain resort called Bariloche that Helen and Simon got their first taste of South American chocolate. It was amazing, Simon says. There were chocolate shops literally everywhere we looked. Although they didn't know it at the time, that town would spark an idea for a future business. Simon and Helen then travelled north through Chile to Brazil and ended up on a cocoa plantation in Venezuela. They spent two weeks mesmerised by the cocoa trees and the breathtaking scenery before disaster struck. While putting on his backpack, Simon's back went into spasm. The pain was debilitating and it transpired that he had suffered a slipped disc. The pain was so severe that he and Helen had no choice but to be repatriated home to the UK. Their plans to travel the world were over. It was a bitter disappointment, and to make matters worse, they had no home to go back to, and no income. They resorted to staying with Simon's parents while he had surgery and recuperated. However, as they reminisce about that time, they both now see that the catastrophe was actually a blessing in disguise. Looking back, remembers Simon, it was fortuitous, because it gave us the time we needed to work out what we wanted to do. We read through the journals that we had written during our time abroad, and one thing kept coming up again and again. Chocolate. Up until then, we had no firm idea of what we were going to do, he says. We thought we might be forced to go back to work in law, or possibly something even worse. My back problem gave us the time we needed to think about our future and create a business plan. If we had carried on travelling, Simon muses, we might have become travel bums and never returned to the UK. Instead, they found something that really excited them. It was an opportunity to try something different and build their own business. Simon's back injury marked the beginning of a new and exciting adventure into the chocolate industry. Their story didn't end there. While Simon recuperated and spent time working on a business plan, Helen took temporary shop jobs to get experience of retailing. The two then scraped together the money needed to open their first chocolate shop in Brighton, Sussex. However, five weeks before they were due to open, they were hit by another much larger crisis. This time, it was commercial. Their main supplier had gone into liquidation. It was a complete shock, says Simon. We were fitting out our shop with less than five weeks to go to the official opening. Then the manufacturer suddenly stopped answering the phone. Initially, we didn't think much of it. But then a week went by and we started to get very concerned. 
Helen drove down to their offices, and it was only then that we discovered the business had gone into liquidation. The company were making over 50% of our products. Simon continues, they held all our designs, molds, labels, the lot. Helen and Simon had two options. They could give up on their dream, or they could risk everything and manufacture the chocolate themselves. We had no experience or knowledge of chocolate manufacture at all, Simon points out. It was a huge crisis by any standards, but by the same token, it proved to be a huge opportunity. They spent the next few weeks researching exactly how to make the chocolate the way they wanted it. Then they ordered equipment, and with the help of family and friends, and a very kind member of staff from one of their suppliers, they began making their own chocolate. It was an incredibly scary time, says Helen. We spent weeks in a tiny converted outbuilding on a farm. We had chocolate all over us and up the walls most of the time, but gradually we managed to keep it in the machine and perfect a few recipes. Forced into manufacturing the chocolate themselves meant that Simon and Helen had a limited range. But it was their range, and it meant that they would have far more control over their business. Since they opened their shop, Montezuma's, named after an Aztec emperor, in the fashionable Lanes area of Brighton in 2000, their business has grown into a chain of seven outlets across the southeast of England. Theirs is yet another business success, forged by two very dedicated people through a series of crises. Losing their main supplier just weeks before their launch proved to be the making of the business. Prior to that point, neither Simon nor Helen had even remotely considered manufacturing their own chocolate. But by becoming a manufacturer, it gave them credibility and opened up a whole new side to the business. A wholesale arm which, as it turned out, became the main spine of the business. Without the wholesale business, Simon insists, we probably wouldn't have a business today. Both Simon and Helen see themselves as optimists. We both look at things as opportunities rather than problems, he says. What we are seeing time and again is that there is often a flip side to crises we face in life. A crisis is a message telling us that there is an opportunity waiting to be found. And sometimes it will be the opportunity of a lifetime. Chapter 4 Life changes when bad things happen. Why bad things are not always bad, and why change is a challenge to make things better. Change has a considerable psychological impact on the human mind. To the fearful, it is threatening because it means that things may get worse. To the hopeful, it is encouraging because things may get better. To the confident, it is inspiring because the challenge exists to make things better. King Whitney, Jr. The moment something happens in our lives that we think of as bad, we tend to look upwards and curse. Whether we have suffered financial loss experienced a business or career disappointment, been involved in an accident, or even been diagnosed with a serious health problem. The common response is, why me? What did I do to deserve this? However, what we don't realize at the time, but often come to appreciate much later, is that it is precisely those setbacks and challenges, or more accurately, our response to them, that determines our future happiness and success. How do you know whether any particular experience in your life is good or bad? For some people, anything that brings pleasure is good, and anything that causes pain is bad. But what would we think of, say, candy floss, which brings pleasure to people who enjoy eating brightly coloured strands of sugar, but will also cause tooth decay and thereby bring pain? Or would the pain caused by a dentist drilling out decay in a tooth be considered bad when ultimately 
the removal of the decay and the refilling of the tooth protects us from even greater pain in the future. Other people think of something as good if it propels us towards our hopes and desires. And conversely, they say that anything that moves us in the opposite direction, away from our hopes and dreams, is bad. But when we look at people like Julio Iglesias, we see that an event that was perceived as bad, because it put an end to his childhood aspirations of becoming a professional footballer, actually turned out to be very good, because it enabled him to pursue a different and, in many ways, bigger dream. Recognising what are good or bad events in our lives is not as easy as we might think. Many people believe that at the extremes, it is clear-cut. For example, most people would agree that hitting the jackpot and winning millions in the national lottery would be good, whereas ending up paralysed in a freak diving accident or losing your legs in a plane crash would be bad. But how do we really know whether something that happens to us is good or bad. This ends Disc 1.